What's going on, everybody? We're here, we're live. Welcome to a brand new Poker Life podcast. My name is Sean Grimwan, a.k.a. Chicago Joey, coming to you from GTO Studios, relocated to Las Vegas, California, Nevada. And, uh, and yeah, man, I'm excited for today's episode today. Just want you know, podcasts are on iTunes, search Poker Life. Also, I think next Monday we're going to have on current high stakes Nolan Holden player on Poker Stars. His name's Oh Hey Cindy. He's been battling at these 5100 games uh, for a bit of time. People have been asking me to get one of these guys on. So like, we're going to have him on on Monday. And, uh, and yeah, man, joining me today on the podcast is a young man who I have known for a very long time. He is a, he's been a very long time poker player at this point in time. Uh, he's been playing mainly high stakes Potlum in Omaha in these recent years. A lot of cash games, a lot of tournaments online, very high stakes live. I know he plays some high stakes, no limit from time to time as well. He's a man. He's he's also founded PLO Quick Pro. Of course, you know, we talk about the PLO Quick Pro manual here. One of the, my, I know John's laughing. My, uh, I always tell him every time we talk about the manual, I say this manual is so fucking good. But, you know, we uh, we talked about this before a couple other episodes. And I talked about how, you know, we got an offer for the book out there. But I don't think people really know who wrote the fucking book. You know, we have Jay Nandez on and, and we talk about the university that just closed down. People know Jay Nandez, but people don't really know, necessarily know about John too much. So I feel like I want to get you on the podcast. He's been a friend of mine for a long time as well. He also co-founded ChipLeaderCoaching.com. Man, this guy's a he's grind he grinds more poker than 99% of people I know. Still, he's always on. He's a beast, man. He's always working real hard. So I'm happy to have him on, man. My buddy John Bocre. What's up, John? Welcome to the podcast officially, my friend. Poppy, what's up, man? It feels like uh, one of our Skype conversations, man. It's cool we get to actually uh, have an official one. I know, man. I know we uh, we spend a lot of time talking regularly, whether it's on the phone or whether it's on Skype or whether it's on whatever. So yeah, it'd be pretty cool to actually do an, uh, an official podcast here. So, so yeah, man. I guess you know when we talk about uh, you know what stakes that you play, why don't you tell people a little bit about you know get into where exactly you might play? Why don't you tell people about the stakes that you play online and live in this uh, you know this this year? Sure. You know I've been grinding ten twenty generally online you know i play 510 i guess but over the last couple of years mid stakes to high stakes uh, i think that for a lot of different reasons um up to 1020 online is pretty much my sweet spot and then live i'll play uh 2550 5100 i played uh some 100 200 but that's not like my normal grinding stakes i think if you would ask me what i the, what i played the most of this summer was 2550 decent amount of 5100 uh, and a lot of 10 and a quarter, but you know how PLO is with the straddling. It's like, if you say five ten, people think you're only buying in for a thousand dollars, but I've played in five ten games where people have lost, you know, like $30,000. So, um, that's just kind of the way PLO goes. And one of the, the reasons why PLO is so popular, because, uh, there's a lot of different ways to play it. There's way more action. Recreational players love it because they don't have to worry as much about like knitting around with all these nitty Hold'em regs. Uh, you know, you're always going to be able to play a big pot. Do you, do you play much high stakes no limit anymore as well, or are you sticking mainly to PLO right now? Just PLO, man. I mean, it's hard to, uh, you know, I live in Denver. It's hard to find uh, high stakes no limit games. I do from time to time, but certainly a lot more time spent uh, playing high stakes PLO at this point. Yeah. How much, uh, you know, how much are you able to work on your your poker game right now? Because obviously you've been playing for many, many years now, man. You've been playing for you know, probably like over 10 years, I feel like at this point. So how much time do you feel like you actually get to spend, whether it's uh, studying your own game or coaching other players or yeah. you know, working on products? You know, how much do you feel like goes into working on your game right now? It depends. I go in spurts. I, I feel like there will be the this two or three month span. For me this year, it was like April and May. I knew the World Series was coming up. And so I was all in on really like crunching the numbers and working on my game, playing a ton, reviewing sessions a ton, talking over spots with players. Uh, but nowadays, a little bit less, I would say. I feel like uh, the better you get and as time goes by, sort of your learning and your playing kind of go together in a way. It's like you don't spend as much time, I don't know, crunching the numbers on poker juice or reading books or watching training videos. You're more so just like thinking about the game, playing a lot, and going over hands. I think that the best players that I know, ironically, um, don't really spend that much time away from the table just like, crunching numbers and using softwares, even though that's probably what people think. The best players that I know are just playing as much as possible. Uh, kind of one of my coaching philosophies that you and I have talked about is a lot of the poker training nowadays really kind of gets you, it, it's really good at getting you uh, better at speaking poker, but not really actually playing poker. And I think a lot of people that I run into, they're really great at breaking down a hand on a forum, or they can always kind of tell you 
uh, what the correct line is, but actually executing it is something that's completely different. Uh, oh, at, yeah. at least, at least in my, at least in my opinion, and certainly at the higher stakes, I think that there's a lot more variance in terms of what standard lines are and how you deviate from standard lines because I think people, whether they're winning or losing, uh, makes a big difference on their playing abilities, right? So uh, yeah, I just think that it's a lot better once you get the fundamentals down and you and you don't have these massive glaring leaks. I think a lot of times you just need to play as much as possible, and especially as you mentioned. You know, I have a have a new daughter who's nine months old, and my time is just limited, so I don't have as much time to sit around uh, watching video after video or or crunching the numbers. So whenever I've got some free time, man, I try to I try to log some sessions. Yeah, I kind of this kind of reminds me of something I thought about. Back when Upswing Poker, or I'm sorry, Reddit once first launched, they had these forums on there. And then people would post hands on there, and then you would see these guys post these like complicated, like these like just very mm -hmm. in-depth sort of like they sound like they're the smartest people, but like I know these guys <clears throat> are playing and they're not they're not really even winning players at the games they're playing. And I feel like a lot of people are, you know, they know the right things to say or they know the right way to do it, but like you put them like put them in the action and they're not even winning players a lot of times. So, you know, I think there's a big difference between knowing the right things and actually doing the right things. And that's an interesting point you bring up that, um, you know, that a lot of the training material now maybe, you know, gets people on that path. And I, I, I don't know if that's, I guess I haven't really looked at too much of the other training material that's out there right now, but I find that kind of interesting. I, I guess anything you, you study or train, you're probably going to know the right thing to say, but do you actually have a lot of experience doing it? Then you actually know what works and what doesn't work and how to adjust. So it's probably like that for a number of different things that you would learn. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, even with my stuff, people, a lot of times when they buy my courses or they get coaching for me, they say, um, well, I don't want to play until I go like through this chapter, or I don't want to do this until I see this video. And they always ask me that I'm like, no, get your ass in the chair and grind. Like you will learn more from playing than you will from reading any book or any video. Sure. Like if you're really not in the mood, like you need to do some learning, but I feel like the ratio should be much higher for playing than learning. And I think it's just a natural human tendency. People always want to think that they have, you know, gone through every piece of information. They've seen every video, they've read every book. And now just having gone through that and having that knowledge makes them win more money. That's actually, that's just really not true. Um, and you see, I see a lot of that with uh, any new software that comes out. Like I remember when Poker Juice first came out and like solvers are now where a lot of the common questions that I get are people say, what do you think of solvers? Like, should I get a solver? And I say, well, it's going to help your game, but getting a solver or really digging into what a solver can do for you, um, it's going to teach you some things, but I'm not necessarily sure. I, it's not even that I'm not necessarily sure. I'm sure that for 90% of the people who buy solvers, they actually don't win more money for a couple of different reasons. I think they misinterpret the knowledge the solver gives them. They don't know how to apply it. Um, it, can, it can actually be, it can be negative EV if you don't know what you're doing. So, yeah, I mean, I guess you could say that for any training material out there, it can be negative EV if you aren't applying that strategy the right way. So, you know, whether that is in a book, whether that's in for a solver, whether that's for, you know, taking a concept from a training video and then saying, okay, I'm going to, Jane Andrews is talking about betting a fucking quarter pot here. I'm going to start betting a quarter pot here. And yeah, maybe, you know, after you get that strategy down over time, it might be a good strategy. But, you know, maybe to start off with, you're going to be losing money doing that strategy for a while and it is yeah. going to be negative EV. It's like with working out, it's like people always, if they're looking to lose weight or get ripped, they want to know the supplement to take that'll make you ripped. And it's like, no, get your ass in the gym and do some squats or whatever, like actually work out. For poker players, that's actually grinding. Like you need to get in there and play and, you know, playing soft games and play good. Don't tilt. There you go. <laughs> uh, we got we got a bunch of guys in the chat, guys. I appreciate everybody tuning in live. Vishal Sarma says, you should get Sammy Parik per 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 on the podcast. He's a high stakes Nolan Holden PL player from India. Now I got a question, John. Is there even an in Indian poker, right? India poker's blowing up here. Chinese poker's blowing up here. China poker, shout out to me. I'm learning Mandarin right now. Uh, uh, Ni hao, motherfuckers. What's happening, <laughs> man? Okay, I'm learning, man. That's my that's my Mandarin. Whoop, my, wait, let me think. What's here? No, wait, no. The men, the men, the men. The men drink water. No wait, fuck. Now, now Ren, now Ren who, now Ren who baby. The men there drink water. That's what it is. You know what it is. You know what it do. Big man and Poppy in the motherfucking house over here. Yeah. yeah. 
Indian poker. You know anything about Indian poker, Poppy? How, how, how do we not know in America? How do we not know about Indian poker, the Chinese poker player? I've never heard of one of these guys, man. I, I see all these Indian names. They all sound, I mean, no shot, no, nothing, but like, you know, yeah, I don't know. You know, in, a, in chip leader coaching, in the CLC, we actually have uh, Nipun Java, who yeah. won a couple of bracelets this summer, one in online uh, and one in the tag team. So I think he's like genuinely one of the first Indian poker players that I know, but there's a lot of potential. I mean, there's a lot of people in India, man. And, uh, you know, I think that PLO is going to blow up there for sure. I think that that's, that's essentially the next, that's, that's where PLO has to go is yeah. Like a country, India, Asia, that kind of thing. Well, John, I know one of us is going to bring pot Omaha to China and that is Mandarin Poppy over here. So don't worry. I am bringing the great game of pot Omaha to China. I will be, Fucking the, the the great white hope over in China for spreading the great game of pot Omaha and poker in general. So, and I'll be uh, I'll be I'll be bringing bringing everything over there, man. I'm pretty excited about that. So, hell yeah, that's what it's all about. So, so yeah, man. I think the big reason I want to have you on is because you know we've been talking about the manual. A lot of people always ask me, how do I get better at pot Omaha? Yeah. You know, how do I how do I learn? What do I do? Do I take university? Do I watch videos? What do I do? And then I mentioned, you know, I talked about the manual that you, that you put out. You know, when did you even write this manual, man? When, when was this thing come out? Well, I started writing it, I mean, uh, let's think about this. I started writing it about six years ago, but it was like a collection of, it started out as sort of like a collection of the lessons that I was teaching to my students. And it grew yeah. into a, a, a full book. I just felt like when I was, it's gotten a little bit better nowadays, but certainly when I first started learning PLO, I felt like all the information was really fragmented and you didn't really know whether the information was good or if it was bad. You know, it's written by, like there was a book back in the day um, by like Rolf Slotboom, for example. And I'm like, I've never even heard of this guy. And I don't know if it's like verified. I just have no idea if this is true. And at the time, there was a lot of new stuff coming out. And there was videos on Deuces Cracked, on Card Runners, on, you know, all these different sites. And it just didn't seem like it was structured very well for somebody who was actually trying to learn PLO from the ground up. So I actually spent pretty much a year nonstop just doing the manual. And like researching what the correct approach was to PLO and I put it all into the book. Yeah, I feel like whenever I you know, whenever I go through the book, I read the book, I feel like it's just, even for me now where I'm at now, it's always like a, you know, whether it's a reminder or refresher, I feel like there's just a lot of fundamental things that you forget over time and you just sort of like goes out of your mind or whatever, you play in certain games, you play against certain players and just things you happen to forget or you don't think about. And, um, you know, I, I, I don't know, man, I, I've, in a way, like, I don't want to, you know, I'm, you know, I'm never big about like advertising things, but now I've kind of shifted my ways a little bit, you know, because we've been getting, there's a lot more material out there for learning pot and Omaha. It isn't necessarily as hard to find as it was before, you know, it's just like running one's poker videos, but now it's, it's sort of changing with things like that. Jane and is trying to bring the solvers to the entire poker world out there. So I feel like, you know, now is a, a good time. And I, I do think the more training material, and this is kind of what I always thought is the more training material out there, the better it is for the game, because I think PLO is such an intimidating game to play yeah, and such a hard game to really learn and it's a hard game to get a grasp on. And then, you know, kind of just the more options you have, the better it is overall for the entire community and for the game moving forward. Uh, yeah, I would agree. I mean, I think that it's easier to people for people to get access to information. I mean, you're not, there's nothing that can stop that. And there's a lot of money to be made playing PLO. Let's, let's be real. So in any market that you have, any business market, it, it doesn't matter if there's a lot of money to be made, people will figure out how to make more money at it. And it's kind of, I just think it's impossible to prevent more um, things coming out that give people better, better uh, PLO training. Young John Spicer in the chat says, Jay Nan has recently said he thinks there is a PLO boom coming while trying to sell his $5,000 course. It's actually a true thing. Do you, do you slash John realistically think there's a PLO boom coming? What percentage chance do you think? Yeah, so uh, I've obviously, this has been an important thing to me for a long time because I always wondered that. I mean, from a selfish perspective, I'm thinking, all right, well, is PLO growing? That was one reason I got into doing PLO training in the first place was to make a couple of dollars on the side, right? So I really did at the time, like what, nine years ago when I started PLO Quick Pro, think that PLO was going to grow a lot. A lot of people were calling it the game of the future. Now, it depends what you define as a PLO boom, right? Is PLO growing on a per month basis. Fuck yeah, it absolutely is. You can't you can't deny that. I, and in fact, like it's funny when I'm sort of like talking to, for example, like I'm talking to uh, had a conversation with uh, the Poker Juice owners long uh, a while ago, and I remember their subscriber base was increasing month after month after month after month. 
um, not only because it's a great software, but because people are literally jumping into PLO. And it's like that all across the board, you know, sales of the manual grow, you know, you've seen Fernando's courses take off. There's just a lot more of a demand for PLO. So on the PLO training side, there's a bigger demand, which makes me think there's clearly more PLO players. Um, and if you just look at the tables in the stars lobby, it seems like there's more tables every day. So I think, I think definitely, but you get, you have to figure out what, like, what constitutes a boom? Will PLO ever be bigger than No Limit? No, it won't. Um, the problem, in, in my opinion, the problem is it's harder to pick up PLO than it is No Limit. No Limit you can pick up in a night with your friends, but PLO is, it's a, it's a little bit more difficult. So I think, will it ever be bigger than No Limit? No. Is PLO going to continue to grow? Yes, definitely. Wait a second. Did you just say there's more and more games on stars ever? I, I can't. But I, I feel like no it's growing. Is. I don't have anything to no. back it up, but I mean, I think like you don't think you think it's actually getting less. I think it seems like it's growing on other sites that I play on, not Poker Stars. Okay. But it seems like on Poker Stars, it's decreasing, and obviously there's a number of different reasons why that might be too. Sure. But uh, in terms of PLO boom, well, of course it's gonna be a PLO boom because I'm bringing the great game to China. <laughs> Ni hao, motherfuckers! I'm yeah. coming to China. You don't understand, man. Big Poppy is the PLO. I'm like the the chosen one. I'm Neo for this game. <laughs> Oh my gosh, no, but I mean a boom. I didn't, I didn't mean exactly the stars lobby. I just meant I felt like across the board, like there's more PLO tables. I mean, I've a good example is I've in the for certainly for live poker, it's booming. I'll, I'll definitely say that. Like for the World Series, when I first started playing the series in like 2011 or 2012, I mean, there was seriously like two 510 tables at the Rio. And I mean, nowadays it's like sometimes there's like eight to 10. And it's like that across the board. So live PLO is definitely booming, I would say. Um, and certainly at the high stakes, I mean, PLO is where it's at. There's not very many high stakes no limit games. Although when high stakes no limit games run, they're typically incredible because they only run when they're inc incredible. Everybody's scared to play everybody else. Yeah, I mean, PLO boom, guys. You know, I, I don't know if that's ever going to actually – you know, who knows, man. I think it's, there's going to be a site that people can play on where they can reasonably run it up or make, make some money to lower stakes. You know, that's the big thing about Poker Stars is, is back in the day, and I think probably still now you can make money at 5 cent, 10 cent. For the most part now, playing 5 cent, 10 cent Pot in Omaha, I mean, you don't got much margin for error. You don't got much room to really, you know, fuck up and still be able to make money there. So until that changes, and if that ever changes, then a different site like you know run once poker obviously in the works you know when that's coming if that comes and they have some sort of better system at the micro stakes then it's possible but i think how it is now is there going to be a boom i don't know is there be more people playing i think so i think the more training material out there the more people can learn the more people can find out about the great game the better it will be but yeah man I don't know, it's an interesting time for poker right now i feel like a lot of things are shifting to live poker as well i think online poker is super segregated at the moment i mean i know you you know, you play a lot of online poker, you know, you play in the untracked sites out there around the world. So, I mean, it's just segregated. You know, you play you play eight hours a day sometimes, 10 hours a day sometimes. And, it's true. you know, no one would ever know. Like, and, and that's sort of how things work right now is that you don't even know the players who are playing a lot online anymore because it's just not, their screenings aren't there like it was with PokerStars. Uh, yeah, I totally agree. Um, I think that a lot of people kind of get, especially recreational players, get intimidated to come somewhere like, like poker stars. I mean, they, you know, especially because they get thrashed so hard and it's like, you know, seat scripting and HUDs, like that int intimidates people. In the uh, untracked sites, you know, a lot of times the HUDs aren't, aren't like the, you can't use HUDs. And I think it kind of levels the playing field a little bit more. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that if, if for a lot of professional players, I think that you should find, I, I think that high stakes live is kind of the nuts. I mean, it's usually softer. Um, it's, you know, you don't have to deal with, like, the seat, seat scripting and stuff like that. So it could be nice in that way. You just have to worry about getting in the game sometimes instead of yeah. seat script. So it's kind of like another form of seat script. You need to yeah, actually exactly. get in the game yeah. with your seat script. So. Yeah, exactly. What are, the, what are the high stakes live games like, John? What are those like? What do you, what are, how do those work for people that down here don't play much high stakes live? High stakes live is way different than online. Uh, generally, there's a shitload of straddling. It's a lot more political. Uh, if you try to, and it's like that all over, all over the country, um, not just where I live, you know, it's, it can be, it can be difficult to get into games unless you know people or you're willing to sell a percentage of your action. Um, mm -hmm. you know, so, um, I don't know how much I can say necessarily, but, 
and it, certainly, I know that in the bigger live games, uh, that's how that's how it's run. It's very it's very political. A lot of times, really high rake, and you need to know somebody or sell somebody a pretty big piece of your action if you're any good and you want to play. If you're not very good, of course, like come on in. But generally, if, for good players, it's hard to it's hard to get in. Yeah, so most of my chat obviously is going to have a hard time getting in. We got a lot of good winning players in the chat right now. So, so I guess in that spot, all right, when you go to these games, are you pl are you bringing your headphones? Are you are you on your iPad the entire time, or, or what's kind of the etiquette there for going to these games? I feel like it's way there's way more manners, and actually, that's one thing that I do miss about Vegas is that it's you can be a lot more. Um, I don't want I don't think transactional is the right word, but you can focus more on playing well and just make it about the money rather than being social or you know having to call like you know call let's say you, you want you know at the casino when you want to leave you just leave you don't say oh uh like i'm i i'm good I, i'm calling two hours you know you can be you can just focus on playing good and leave when you want to leave and you don't have to worry about getting paid and all that shit it's like it's nicer in that way but in live games you need to especially if you're a good player and you're winning you need to be social you need to be fun um you need to cater more towards the recreational players so there's mm -hmm. there's a big difference for sure I would say. Yeah, I remember you posted a photo one time about getting paid from a game, and and a guy brought how much money he brought in in in, in buckets of pennies or something like that, right? Like, what, what was that? What happened there? Twenty-two thousand. You paid me in uh, nickels, dimes, and pennies. Wow. Oh. So why did he pay you twenty-two thousand in nickels, dimes, and pennies, John? What, what did you do to this man? I slow rolled him in this like pretty big pot, and then it took him like a month to pay me or something, and I was like, oh, it's like not a big deal, like. Get it to me, whatever. And then, like one day, so this is a this is a, this is a funny story. But uh, I play with a bunch of these guys, right? And they were giving me a hard time because I had strung together a couple of winning sessions. And uh, they like were talking shit to me about how they were gonna slow pay me, and then how they like were gonna pay me in coins. And I'm like, whatever. They're just talking shit. So uh, one day, like I answer the door, and the guy he had actually come over because he said he he was gonna like run the check by me. And I was like, oh, okay. So he like comes in the door. We're like making conversation, but he's staying like way longer than he was just kind of like hanging around. I'm like, all right, dude, like, where's the check? Like, get the hell out of here. But he's like, oh, can, come outside. I've got the check in my car. We go around to the driveway and literally like eight buckets by six. There's like 40 buckets out in my driveway by, behind my car so that I can't pull out of all change. It's literally like fucking, yeah, it's just like a mountain of change. And they were all wearing shirts that said fuck Bo on. With a picture of a black cat, because they called me the black cat motherfucker. It was like, it was silly. I saw it actually reported in a Brazilian like poker website, which was really funny. And I got it got retweeted by uh, like like uh, Mike Matisau, which I thought was funny because I'm like, Mike Matisau has seen some serious DJ shit. So if Mike Matisau thinks that this is this is funny, then then it must be. So what do you do with forty buckets of of nickels, dimes, and quarters to cash in this twenty two thousand dollars? Like, what you bring it, put it in the trunk? Like, where does where does it go? How does it work? At first, I was like, you know what, fuck these guys. I'm not gonna let them like waste. I, I'm gonna actually like I'm gonna unroll these with like a smile on my face and just like collect my money, you know. And then, uh, man, like after one night and realizing that seriously, it was like an hour for every bucket that it took me to unroll all this change and dig through it. I finally paid like a friend of mine's brother to do it all and like take it to a bank. <laughs> it was fucked up. There's worse, problems. You verified There's worse problems to have though. There's worse problems to have. I was, uh, I was telling them that uh, when they beat me out of a big amount, I'm going to buy them like some really shitty car and just like drop the shitty car off at their house and be like, oh, there you go. Or like buy them a horse and just put it in their backyard and be like, oh, this horse is worth like $7,500. Good luck. Well, I guess you, you don't see that in the online poker world, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I definitely prefer live poker nowadays, but I think that it's really hard to improve if you're just playing live poker. Um, I think that online is definitely, like, it depends on what your goals are. If your goal is to be, like, the best player, you cannot do it live only. You just can't. Um, but live is good for changing your perspective on – how to play against certain opponents. It's also good for getting used to playing deep stacked live. And it's also good training for live poker when, I mean, live poker is really soft and at the world series it's live. So you need to at least be a little bit good at live so you can take advantage of those soft PLO tournaments and cash games at the world series. Mm. So how do you, how do you get better playing live poker then? Because I feel like a lot of people go play live poker and they, you know, they just sort of play. They go, they play, they go home, they play, they talk one hand with their buddy Jimmy, and then, and then they go back and play again. They don't really 
you know, I, I guess what's the process like? So I haven't really played too much live and really thought about or worked on getting better at my live poker game. Sure. If people, if people get live coaching from me, I try to keep it as simple as possible. I tell them, you don't need to write like every hand that you VPIP, but what you need to do is any hands that are significant or any situation that you find to be uh, like uncomfortable or where you thought your play was bad, you need to write the following details about a hand. There's really three. You need to write the stack sizes of the players. You need to write what position you were in and what bet sizings were used during the hand. And of course, the board texture like and the action. But besides that, those are like the main things that you really should pay attention to in each hand. And even just, I feel like half of being good at poker or winning at poker is paying attention to the right things. It's like most people just don't, they either don't have the attention span to pay attention to the right things um, or they don't know what those things are. So just telling people to like pay attention to that is important, I think. So outside of those three things, what other things do you think people don't pay attention to enough or ever? I think timing and physical tells. I feel like that if you're a good live player, a lot of people talk shit about how there's no skill in reading live tells or like, or things like that. But I mean, if you, if you notice subtle tendencies about your opponents, um, it can be like having an extra hut when you don't have a hut. And I feel like that's where um, the experience live really comes from. Live players get a lot of shit because they're live players and their theory isn't that good, but they make up for it and, or they're able to overcome like their theoretical leaks by being good at reading players, so to speak. It's not reading players like, oh my God, he blinked twice like this guy. He, I know he has kings. It's like knowing, you know, generally like if they're weak or if they're strong. So I feel, do you use the online platform to sort of improve your skill playing live too? Or do you think there's not much crossover? Because I know for myself, just working on my online game is going to get me better at my live game. And obviously live plays a little different. There's a lot more multi-way pots, a lot deeper stacks as well. So there are some different dynamics. For the most part, that's the way that I would, I would go upon doing it, just work on my online game, and that would naturally get my live game better as well too. Yeah, there's a ton of, there's a ton of carryover for sure. I mean, absolutely. If you – there's no way that if you improve online that you won't improve live. I'm just saying that the learning process live is slower and it's a it's somewhat of a different skill set. And it's also like somewhat of a different game that runs. Like live is generally full ring deep stacked live. And there's not that much like full ring deep stacked live. Yeah, sense? I mean, it's definitely weird because as you mentioned, it is so deep stack and, and that is going to impact the way that you play certain hands and the way that you approach certain things. Yep. I think a lot of players, when they go play, even like the, you know, the, the one, three game or whatever fuck it is, one, two, one, three at the Aria and they buy in $500, which is what people feel buying for there. They win some money. They're up to 900 bucks. Now they got 300 big blinds. I mean, yeah. people don't know how to play 300 big blinds deep. They're like calling, cold calling three bets, but just like they just... You don't even know what you're, you're just like really clicking yeah. all these different buttons like that. And, and it's got to be tough for, I mean, it just makes sense to me why it's so challenging for a lot of people out there to really learn PLO because you play normal hold them and you go play live, you know, three big blinds deep, you know what I mean? You got aces, like they got kings, like, you know, sort of plays, a lot of those hands play themselves. And a lot of hands in PLO, the bigger pots maybe do play themselves and you have that in a flush draw over pair, yeah. three bit pot versus strong hand. But at the same time, those, and those hands are so rare. You know, oftentimes you end up in a lot of marginal spots, deep stack, where you just aren't really sure what to do and you just make a, a number of consecutive close or, you know, slightly let minus EV decisions and those add up to be those add up to be not a very good thing in the long run. Yeah, well, I think that the hardest part for online players, like when they're transitioning to live, is live is different because of the straddling. The straddling actually makes a huge difference in terms of how you adjust. Um, you know, and there's a big difference between how you play when there's like an under the gun straddle or how you play when there's a button straddle, or who's in the straddle, how big the straddle is, because a lot of these games have varying straddles. Let's say you go to the World Series and you play a 5-10 game, well, a lot of times they don't cap the straddle. So depending on who's in the game, the straddle could be to 20, it could be to 100. I mean, I've Dude, seen I, I hate that, man. I gotta say, when I play at the Rio, like, I don't I don't want to go play the fucking 5-10, the guy just going for 100 in the butt. What the fuck are you doing, guy? Like, why, like, why are you straddling to fucking $100 in the butt? It, did, it, it, it doesn't make any sense to me, John. Why do people straddle for $100 fucking dollars at 5-10? Please tell me. Please. Well, because they're DJs. That's why PLO is so good. Because the, it's like, why do people put more money on a blackjack hand? Like, why do they, like, vary their sizing on a blackjack hand without seeing the cards, right? It's like they're stuck or they're up or, I don't know, they have position on fucking whoever. It's like nobody can explain their – d jenny spidey senses or whatever you want to call it like people they just fire 
What's the craziest thing you saw this summer? You see like somebody straddle, like all in or something? I mean, do people, I, I can't, people do that at 1025? People are doing those in those games? I have had a few drinks this summer and I definitely put the 500 on at a 5-5 five five game a few times. <laughs> Look, I put, the 500, I put the 500 straddle on at a 5-5 five five game a few times this summer. Wait a second, blinds are $5, $5. You put a straddle on for $500. That's right. How'd that turn out? I actually won that session somehow. I just ran like God. I had a deal this summer where like, it's like my, sometimes I'll like have some drinks and I'll play like drunk poker during the summer. Every time, like, it, but my thing is, is like, yeah, I'll straddle. Or if somebody's being a nit, I'll subsidize their straddles. But the thing is like, you can do it strategically to, to your advantage. There's like, I, I, this is gonna sound so stupid, but I swear there's strategy in straddling. Like in terms of how much you straddle, where you straddle from. Let's see if you can actually think about it. Think about, it. do you think that there's any type of, have you ever noticed any type of straddling strategy? You know, it's weird. In the, in the, in the book you wrote, there's actually a drunken straddle chapter. It's small, <laughs> it doesn't really offer too much, but it kind of talks about you have six shots of whiskey and then you put a lot of money in before. It's a very weird job, uh, unexpected chapter to see in, uh, in someone's strategy training book. But, you know, it's okay, whatever. You know, you know a guy like you likes to have a drink. But now if I'm thinking about that, I would imagine there is. So this is a way we can straddle from anywhere, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we can from, I imagine there, there would be some, if the button is really tight, the guy to our left maybe is a really tight player or in the cutoff, maybe we want to straddle then. Mm -hmm. If they're... If there is, I guess, the, the one of the worst players in the blinds, maybe we want to straddle then. Yeah. I don't know when it's ever GTO straddle for 500, buddy, but. <laughs> not at those stakes. Not at those stakes, but it depends a lot who you have position on, right? If you have position on, then like, especially in a shorthanded game, it's rare in a nine-handed game or like an eight-handed game where straddling is good, like, or plus EV. But in a four-handed game when, like, somebody on your left is tight, it's super plus EV. Um, you know, you get to play, you get last action preflop, in position against two people, like, you know, a high percentage of the time. So forehanded is, like, pretty much when that's going to be, like, the GTO straddling opportunity in general. Now, in terms of choosing how, if you're in a game where you can choose how much you straddle, you can do it based off of stack sizes. Obviously, um, if you're deeper on people, you can do a little bit of a bigger straddle, especially if they're more passive. Um, but, of course, like, it would be terrible to straddle when you have somebody good or somebody really loose who's on the button. So. I mean, there's a lot, there's actually, like, I play with, uh, I play with one guy pretty frequently uh, here in Denver who, like, at first when I started playing with him, I was like, this guy, he was straddling every hand, he was, like, varying how much he was straddling, and I was like, this guy is the fucking worst, like, what a fish. But actually, there was some method to his madness in terms of, like, what he was doing, and it took me a while to figure it out, I was like, oh my god, he's not just, like, channeling his inner degeneracy, he's, like, doing this strategically, um, and I, it kind of kind of actually helps me um, for live games. Uh, quick uh, warning here to anybody listening right now. If you go to your live game tonight or, or sometime soon, please do not start randomly straddling and think that you understand a system because most likely <laughs> oh, yeah. so please, we give you a warning. Do not try that on John's recommendation tonight. I mean, straddling, straddling in general um, is negative EV, but there's spots where I think that it's actually a decent option. And like, so... The trick is with live games, especially if you're getting, if it, especially if it's a private game, it's taking every opportunity, if you're a good player, it's taking every opportunity to appear looser than like you really are. So like one example is straddling. If you, it's a cheap way to like VPIP hire and put more money into the pot and make it look like you're um, looser than you really are. And it keeps like a lot of the looser, like recreational players happy if they see you straddling, you know, cause they're playing bigger pots. You're willing to surrender some some EV um, to them. You know what I mean? So I think that's like the trick with live. But in private games specifically, is trying to figure out creative ways to spew without giving away too much. Yeah, I remember I, I, there was some a live game I played in a couple times. They had these massage women there, and they would do these massages. Uh, like they would do them topless sometimes if you want. It was a lot of line games, John. So here, so I would be playing tight in the game sometimes if you were playing crazy, but I always made it seem like I was playing loose. Here's what I used to do. I used to get a Corona. I used to drink a fucking Corona pretty fast, whatever, because I know I, I can drink a lot of Coronas. Now yeah. I get another Corona. I'd be like, hey, man, I need a massage from a massage girl. 
she'd come over there, I'd be flirting with her, I'd be talking a lot at the table, yep. right up, and then I would take her to the back where they had this little back area. We go in this little back room for a full body massage. I come back out, I'd be like, man, yeah, man, talk, having a good time. I'd be telling other people they need to go try the girl out there. And I'm talking the entire time, drinking the corona, having another girl maybe come back, do that, and then yeah. uh, and then at that point they're like, man, this guy's fucking crazy, right? This guy's crazy. Yeah, yeah what kind of crazy guy's gonna be like so now that I can stay tight and then I could take advantage and um you know take advantage of my tight image in that situation. Yeah, for sure. You know, like ordering shots, like taking shots, like I don't know. It, it it definitely helps with your image. The worst you can do is like you mentioned, like headphone headphones, iPad, all that in a private game is no bueno. I think it's a poor play. I mean, you, you know, I think it's a poor play overall. It doesn't matter as much in the casino, but if you're in a private game, it's no good. I actually, um, I uh, I didn't witness, but I heard a pretty crazy story at at a game that I played this summer. If you want to hear it, allegedly, let's hear it. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so I, I was at the Aria, and um, I was playing this 10-25 uh, game, all right? And uh, I, showed, I showed up, and I didn't know, like, anyone at the table besides one guy. But he is sitting on a fucking mountain. He's got, like, 30K at a 10-25. I'm like, who is this guy? And there's a seat open. They're playing, like, actually, like, four-handed. So I just sit, I sit on his left. And pretty soon, like, he ends up stacking me in this, like, 30 k where he the flop came eight eight six, and uh, it was a three bet pot, and I had a uh, king king nine eight. Okay, and he ended up like uh, stacking me. He had pocket sixes. Doesn't matter. Um, so he builds up this massive stack, and I end up getting wrecked this night. I think I, I actually ended up losing like thirty k. This was like one of my last sessions for the summer, and uh, I uh, like I leave, and I'm not like steam. I'm just tired. I'm like over it. I'm like ah, I think the game's gonna die soon anyway. And then I, uh, Rob Celebru was in the game. You know Rob, Rob Celebru? I've heard of him, but I, I've never played them before. Okay, well, the November Niner from a bunch of years ago? Yeah. Um, so I end up writing him on Twitter, and I'm like, dude, how'd the, uh, how'd the game end up, like, just out of pure curiosity? He ends up telling me that the guy that was on my right that had all of those chips played, get, dude, it was a 10-25 game, and they ended up making it 10-25, 50, 100 mandatory. All right, mandatory. So you can imagine the 200 was on at least like half the time because the, these guys were kind of getting in there. And uh, he ends up telling me this pot happens where the dude that was on my right, right, the Asian guy and this other guy from Austria were like in a fucking war against each other. They just hated each other. And they get in, there's a three bet pot, a four bet pot preflop. I don't remember the exact action. I'd have to pull it up, but it goes like this. There's a four bet pot preflop where the Asian guy had called out of position. All right. Or yeah, out of position. And the guy in position was the four better, obviously. And it comes uh, like queen, four, deuce, all clubs. The Asian guy leads and the other guy calls. The turn's like a five or like a seven or something like that. Nothing, like a brick. The Asian guy uh, leads. Okay. The other guy calls. And then the river, th there's no straight. Nut flushes the nuts, okay? That's all that matters. The Asian guy goes all in, and the other guy goes into the tank for like five minutes and finally calls. Okay. Okay. And the Asian guy is like, "You're good, man. Like you're good, dude. Like I was bluffing. Like I don't have anything." And the guy, and they're kind of like doing the back and forth that you do live, where it's like, "What do you have? Like, he, show your cards. You've got to show your fucking hand." Like, no, I'm not showing. You have to show your hand. He's like, "Dude, I don't have anything." So finally, he gets the guy who's in position to show his hand, and the guy, all he has is one pair. He has a pair of kings. That's all he has. Okay. And the guy like checks back his cards and is like checks back his cards and he said he waits like five minutes and finally turns over the fucking nut flush to slow roll him for a like a seventy five k pot. It's pretty sick. I, I don't know if I could ever slow roll somebody for a seventy five k pot. What the fuck? <laughs> and so the guy leaves and he's like, I hated that motherfucker. He's like, I've been playing poker for thirty years. I've never slow rolled anyone. That was the only time I've ever slow rolled anyone. Pretty crazy. How would they get that much money in? Wait, so the four bet. Post like, four. These guys both have like 30k plus, and they end up playing this literally like a 70k. These are the. This is what happens though in these PLO games. They just completely spiral out of control. Like this always happens. It's like like I said, you hear you hear this all the time at the at the series where it's a five five game and some dude wins like twenty thousand dollars. It's like how did how did this happen? It's because of the straddling. I actually, 
this is a funny. I, oh man, I got a, I got a hand for you from from just two nights ago. I'll tell you about. Okay, let's hear so it. So the blinds are uh twenty either tw tw well the blinds changed throughout the night. It was either ten twenty five or twenty five fifty. Must have been twenty five fifty. So the blinds. Listen to this. With the straddling, the blinds were at 25, 50, 100, 200, 400, 800, 1600, 3200. Everyone had dead money in the pot. It was a whatever handed game it was. But because basically it was like the dude who was under the gun put the 100 on, and the dude next to me, or two to my right, puts the 200 on. And then they're like, oh, hey, he's like, if, if I put the 400 on, are you going to put the 800 on? And I'm like, nah, I, don't, I, I like really don't want to. And he's like, come on, dude. And so he just puts the 400 on, and I'm like, and everyone's giving me a hard time. I'm like, and I'm like up in the game. So I'm like, fine, I'll, I'll put the 800 on. So I put the 800 on. And right as I put the 800 on, the dude to my left, snap puts the 1600 on. Like not even like, just put, I'm like, no. So then the guy who's on the button, he like hems and haws for a second. And they're like, do it, do it. He's like, fuck it. He puts the 3200 on, and I'm like, oh my God, this is fucking weird fucking gambling problems so they deal out the hand listen to this shit and so now like every the, i'm like well looks like i'm going to be playing a four big blind pot or i'm going to be going all in for four big blinds basically so folds folds around right to the guy on my right he goes all in for like he goes all in for probably like six thousand maybe it's like sixty five hundred dude i look down to aces i fucking ace ace Queen, 10, 6. It's five card pillow. I have ace, ace, queen, 10, 6. Right? I'm all in for like, you know, I cover the other players. The guy behind me who had the 1600 on, he's all in for like 6,000. And the guy on the button who put the 3200 on, well, he can't fold. Right? So he's all in. So we have a four way all in in this like massive 50, 25, 50, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, $3,200 pot. And they're like, do you want to run? Do you want you guys want to run it once or twice? I'm like, I only want to go once. And they're like, come on, go fucking twice. I'm like, all right, we're gonna go twice. So the first board runs out: ace, king, five, jack, x. So I, I fucking have the nuts on the first board. So I'm like, yes. And the second board runs out. It's like something, and I end up chopping with the guy on my right for this like pretty big pot for this like twenty-five for whatever thousand dollar pot where everybody was all in free. I fucking I, I I mean I like that's it, but I hate PLO. That's PLO. That that, that, that <laughs> would never happen in a hold'em game ever. It's like you play twenty five fifty all night long, and then all of a sudden it's like thirty two hundred is the I, I, man. Games like that are fucking crazy, man. Well, that I game, was annoyed because I was stuck, and then like I was like pretty stuck, and then I wasn't stuck anymore, and then they're like put the eight hundred on, and I'm like, I know I'm gonna have to play this huge pot, and I but like all right, oh fuck it, I guess. But I got yeah, I got aces in, in like the dream spot where it's like everybody's already all in. I mean, although. Aces, I think I was even double suited, but I think uh, I don't think Aces even has like a big equity advantage there. I mean, it's five card PLO, four four away. Like I, I'd love to run. I'd actually would love to run that, but I'm sure I didn't even have that good odds. Probably like twenty. <laughs> oh, bless me. Thank you. Thank you to me, everybody out there in the chat. We got my buddy Algan out there. He says, "What is this? A GTO club meeting?" We got Lee Liam's in the chat. We got Johnny Spicer in the chat. If you guys don't know, I had my, my GTO club. I had that for um, I mean, for about eight months, and uh, and John was a member of that. A couple other guys in the chat were a member of that too. And uh, I shut that down for summertime when I came. I heard of the World Series of Poker, and um, probably should have kept it open because my life got a little bit out of line during this World Series of Poker. I mean, I'm still in Vegas right now, so that's going to show you how out of line my life got and how much I enjoyed it. But uh, but yeah, man, it's like a little reunion in here right now with a bunch of the guys. Right. But, uh, shout out to all the guys out there, man. What's up? What's up? This is like a reunion, man. We still uh, chat on Skype occasionally. So yeah, I haven't been. I haven't really been on Skype in like four months either. So I kind of just uh, I, I joined the out of line lifestyle, my friend, and um, and yeah, I went all in on the out of line lifestyle. But now now I'm not. I'm out of the out of line lifestyle. I'm in the in line lifestyle. So yeah, doing pretty well. How is it working for you when you when you have this child of yours, obviously new, newborn? Yeah, you want to play a lot of poker. It seems like you play online poker all day long. What's sort of your approach and your schedule like when it comes to getting in poker and also family time? Yeah, so uh, I've well, you need to it like really changes your priorities. Like I sleep so much less than I used to, but 
not just because actually, well, let me back up. The things that I really need to get done, I have to wake up so early for. I generally wake up between 4.30 and 5 in the morning um, because I only are, Sophie is her name, Sophia, wakes up at like 7 in the morning. So I have this like two-hour window where nobody needs anything from me, where I don't need to help with, like with the baby. And I can just like take care of the stuff that's like really, really important. So it's helped me. I mean, I know you read in these productivity books uh, that – you know, you want to have like a priority goal that you accomplish in the morning before anything else. So it's actually, I feel like since I've had a kid, I'm way more productive in a really weird way. It's sort of like when you're in school and if you take less classes, you're like way lazier. And then if you take more classes, somehow you like get better grades and are more productive. It's kind of like that. It's like the more things I pile on, somehow I figure out a way to be more efficient at it. And if I'm not, then I, it kind of tells me that this is something I'm, that isn't important to me that I am not taking seriously. So I've cut out a couple of things that I just wasn't doing a very good job with. Mm. So I don't know if that makes sense. No, for sure. I and mean, how do you manage the business? Obviously you got the PLO quick pro.com. You got the chip leader coaching as well. You have your own desire to play poker. Sure. How do you sort of decide which one to do? How do I decide which one to do? I mean, it's a numbers game, you know? Uh, I think that I try to focus on things that make money and not spend too much time on things that don't. And things that are important to me, but that other people can do, I really try to delegate. I've gotten a lot better at delegating. I've hired a couple people this year. Um, one's named Allison. He's probably watching right now uh, to help me with things, just straight up. So I've gotten a lot better at delegating and giving people instructions on helping me with with things. That's really, mm -hmm. that's really, I mean, that's how. So where's, the, where's the focus stand now with your PLO product, PLO Quick Pro? You have courses on there. You have books on there. You yep. might have some. New stuff coming out. I don't. I don't know. I'm. I'm. I think it's like secret. Is it a secret? I can't I'll say what it is. No, it's out now. I haven't. I haven't sent. Uh, announced it to my email list. But yes, we just came out with a brand new course uh, at PLO Quick Pro called Three Bet Pots Game oh, no. Theory and Practice. Oh and my it's God! All no. about using the information in solvers to give me the affiliate code for this one, John. I need. I'm gonna need this book. This book stick. I got. I, got I, I do happen to have a copy of that book over here. There we go. And um. I do. It's very. How much is this book? Fifteen hundred bucks. Fifteen hundred dollar. Make you holla. Jesus, man. I mean, this book's so fucking good too. I feel like, but you know, the thing is, if you're, it, it's it's high priced, but I'd be pretty surprised if like the knowledge in that book didn't pay for itself if, within like a couple of sessions. If you're playing any kind of meaningful stakes, like one, two, two, five. Yeah, I mean, I mean this ain't like a this ain't a beginner book. I'm gonna tell you that right now. This is a book for an no. experienced veteran. Yeah. About it, so. But yeah, if you guys want to check it out, it's it's in the product catalog over at the site. There's more details about it. It was uh, done with me and my um, GTO coach. His name's Corey Mike. So. Does he play poker too? He plays Pot Lemon Omaha, the great game? He plays the great game of Pot Lemon Omaha, so yeah. Do you have an online screening or something like that? Uh, I don't know what is on. He's plays on uh, he was playing on uh, Ignition, so I don't know if he has like an official screen name. Oh, you probably, bat probably battled him. You probably battled him on Ignition. I've probably played with um, anyone that's played a lot of ignition. I've I've certainly played with at the 1020 games. So there you go. Um, so, yeah. This so Chris asks, uh, how do you determine when you can take money out of the poker bankroll for other things, or just put aside for profit? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I don't really have. I mean, I don't really have poker bankroll that much separate from life bankroll. I feel like let it roll, Chris. Let it roll, baby. Put it in the put it in the dice and, and let it listen. I mean, I don't know. I feel like you know, some you, people ask these questions, John, and then you got the fucking dorks out there that give those, oh well, of course you should have you should have this right here and then have it segregated from your from your this uh, and listen, man, nobody fucking doing things like that, guys. Let me be real with you, okay? I, I'm not gonna I'm gonna if you want like the theoretical answer you're never gonna do, you can go ahead and get that fake shit, okay? But you want the real answer, the real answer is most people keep that stuff together, bro, and they make yeah. it work, they manage it. All right, sure. The the the, the perfect GTO solver theoretical people are gonna do it. They're gonna have this. You're gonna have enough buy-ins for for six months living expenses, and you're gonna have hundred buy-ins for the stake that they play. But like, come on, bro. Ain't nobody fucking doing that out there that I know about. So it's tough. And maybe I, that's not the right approach. Maybe you want to take this. You want to take the correct approach. But we know a lot of people out there. I'm taking the correct approach. That's the real answer, Chris. Yeah, I mean, it's tough to separate the two. Um, I'm not. I don't think that I'm the best advisor for bankroll management. I think <laughs> it depends on how much, how expensive your life is. If if you're like a young dude and you have no expenses, you should be playing fucking aggro with your bankroll. It depends how good you are too. Like you need to be honest. Like if you're a good player and you're young, 
you should be playing fucking aggro with you should be like going for it if you're but if you're like a you know 40 year old dude with a family well and you're like not that good well then you need to kind of play tight with your bankroll it just depends i think the biggest biggest factors that you can think about is how good are you like how big is your edge in the game and how much non-poker money are you making you don't know my approach used to be john and and still i guess not as much anymore you know i'm not really well yeah i mean uh, let me take that back i still do that sometimes here's my approach man let's do it let's go there you go run it up let's see what happens start putting some thirty two hundred dollars straddles on it's a good investment not gonna be able to do it now man i ain't putting no thirty two hundred dollars listen i don't care i don't know how rich i need to be to put a thirty two hundred dollars straddle on but i can't foresee myself anytime in the near future putting a thirty two hundred dollars straddle on i just i i don't think i'll be able to do it i felt like that was irresponsible yeah i mean you think they're not gonna invite you back to the game you don't put a thirty two hundred dollars straddle on or the eight hundred dollars straddle on I think that the guy who puts the $3,200 straddle on is getting invited back forever. Yeah. But you got any was, sort of warm-ups for yourself, man, when you get ready to start a session? You, I know you have I know you have some affirmations you like to read. I mean, I, the thing is, every question I've asked you, I already kind of know the answer to. I'm just like, I just ask them and I pretend like I don't know what the answers are. Just for give people a little insight for all the questions I've asked John so far. I technically kind of know uh, what he's going to say for everything. So, uh, but I, I might, I might seem like I don't, I don't know what, what he's going to say, but I kind of do. So just like, that's a little hint of it from that perspective and see if you can pick up on it. But yeah, like when you go into a session, you got some warm up you like to do, any sort of thing you read or anything you go over or anything like that. Yeah. I mean, it varies. I think that for uh, cash games, I usually like to read a hand just to get your brain working a little bit or watch some type of video. Mm-hmm. Um, like it could be one of your videos. It could be like a, one of Doug's videos or Fernando's videos where it's just talking about a hand, talking, hearing someone talk intelligently about a hand really helps kind of get your brain in, in, in the flow. Um, I, I do have poker affirmations. Uh, I find that, um, uh, not just like reading them out loud, but writing them out by hand actually really, um, actually really improves the likelihood that like I follow what's in the affirmations and affirmations are just me to a a reminder for why i'm playing you know reminding me Mm -hmm. to like play good basically because sometimes i forget why i'm playing so yeah i do have affirmations i think you you have great great, you have great affirmations though you have the very it's very good yeah well you got me into that so i have you to thank they're very the affirmations are good they're having the right mindset's good priming some people prime the mind now i feel like man i feel like uh you know, as I as I as my focus becomes less and less on, on making money from poker and more on how can I make money from other things, and obviously now, you know, I'm going to be learning Mandarin, the, the great language of the fucking powerful Chinese Chinese poppy over here. Mm-hmm. I think I'm going to become a Chinese person, John, and I'm pretty excited. You kind of have like a little Chinese look going on with yourself, to be honest with you, man. You know, you got that little. <laughs> See, here it is, right there. You got that little Chinese. You, are you are you're part Asian, right? You're part what? What are you Filipino? Oh, yeah, I'm I'm part Filipino. That's me. Yeah. Interesting. Man. So, what's the current? So, I guess people, you know, you grew up in Denver. You grew up in Colorado. Yeah. What does your family and what does your wife think about you being in the playing poker, <clears throat> you playing these these gambling related products? Because I, I know that you have uh, your your lineage or maybe what you might have done in an alternate timeline certainly <laughs> would not be uh, anything poker or gambling related. You'd probably be in the political world or something of that nature. Sure. Yeah, my family's been in politics for a long time. Uh, my dad was actually a U.S. congressman back in the day, so poker is not like necessarily uh, like in my blood. But I love games, right? And my parents are great, man. Like they really are. My family's really supportive. I think that my dad views it. He's like a super entrepreneur. You know, he uh, he's like. That, that's kind of where I get it from. And he views, and I've explained this to him, as poker is like the ultimate form of entrepreneurialism. It's kind of what draws a lot of people to poker is that it's sink or swim. If you don't put in the work and you're not better than your opponents, you are going fucking bust. And I actually, it sucks when you're on the bad end of that, but I, I kind of like it because I'm very competitive. And I think a lot of people are like that too who play poker. It's comforting to know that somebody, like I, I, I create my own edge in this game. and. Like I'm the only one that's preventing me from winning for the most part, right? So, um, and I think that they see that I'm not just like a complete degen. Like I'm not just like at the tables, like 
blasting away my money all the time. And they see that, you know, I've got a poker training business, a couple of poker training businesses now, and also that it makes me happy. And I think that if you're a parent, that's what you really want is you want your kid to be doing something that he likes. And I think that if you're doing, if you're taking poker seriously for this long, you must really fucking like it because it's not easy. It's actually extremely hard. Um, there's a lot of like big barriers to blow through. There's, it's really easy to quit. Like if you don't quit, then you must really love it. Or, I mean, or you're a degen, I guess. Yeah, probably degenerate. You're probably more of a degenerate sometimes than, uh, yeah. than anything else. Skylar Beckett out there. Uh oh. He says, put on your Jay Nandez hat. Did you, why should I invest in PLO Quick Pro? Um, I mean, I think that PLO Quick Pro, in particular, the manual, is the best, most comprehensive guide to learning the fundamentals for winning PLO. And I really believe that. I think that in terms of having it all put together for someone who wants to, learn how to, who wants a good foundation for like uh, beating low stakes or live poker. I think it's excellent. Um, somebody who is already a, a big winner at the mid stakes plus, um, I think the quick pro manual is probably going to be a review for them, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a bad book, but who the manual is for is, yeah, somebody who is just learning how to play PLO or is transitioning from no limit or is having trouble beating like low stakes PLO. Hmm. If you guys do want that that book, there's a link in the description below. You can check that out. Sign up to that. I'm giving out some. Uh, we put, have a Facebook group that uh, people in there ask questions to me, ask questions to John. Probably be doing some more stuff for that as well because I, I do. I mean, I talk about the book, man. I love I love the book. I don't know. I don't know, man. It's like I feel like every time I read it, but I don't know if I love the book or I just love, or if I just love Pop and Omaha because anytime I anytime I look at anything PLO, I'm like, fuck, I love this game so much. It's just like. <laughs> I, I don't know, man. I love I love PLOs. I, I don't know why, man. I'm not sure. I don't know. I can't figure it. I don't know, man. It's just it's a great game, dude. There's no explanation. You don't need to. Exp you don't need to. Uh, you don't need to explain your love more than that, Poppy. Yeah, Johnny Spice says they see I'm not bla just blasting money away. I hope they didn't listen to this podcast of that thirty dollar straddle story you told. So. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't. I didn't tell my mom that story. Well, I hope they're not watching this right now. So, what does your wife think about this, man? You're obviously your wife. You know, she's not probably didn't expect to marry someone who would be a. <laughs> A professional gambler and how does she feel about you, you being a poker player playing all day long while, while Sophia is sitting on the lap maybe getting a hand or two in there I think she respects it I think that uh and she sees that I like it and I'm involved in a lot of other stuff I mean it's not like I'm just grinding all day I try to uh I do try to separate the two and I think it's healthy to have something else to work on in the past when all I could do like all I was doing was playing eventually I either get burnt out or I start losing and it's like when I'm losing, I just need something else to do that makes me feel good, that makes me feel like I'm succeeding. Because there are just, I ha I've had that recently, where you know you go a week or two where it just seems like you can't get a break. Like, you're not winning. And so it's nice to be like, all right, I'm taking a break and I'm going to do something else that I enjoy and that also actually makes money. So I think that I think that's pretty important. You know what I mean? <laughs> man, man, going through a, a bad week or two, that's, that's a struggle, John, for sure. You're like, yeah. <laughs> Bad week or two, buddy. <laughs> so, uh, John isn't going to swing in 55 years, if you couldn't understand what he's saying. So, we got, we got, we got, we got, got yay, yo. All I know is, yay, yo, Mark playing in the chat. Johnny Boy in the pod. What's up, bud? Hope all's going well. Shout out to Mark out there. Mark, hope things are going well for you. Hope that you're, you're, uh, well, I can't say that. I can't say that in honesty. I hope, I was going to say, hope you're laying off the yay, yo, but you know, I can't. Do whatever you got to do, bro. Do whatever you got to do. Have a good time. Blake. We got Blake Eastman out there. He says, yeah, two of my favorite people in poker shop, the Blake Eastman. Blake is the kind of man, John, that you might say is – you know what? He's past tells, John. You know what? He's beyond, he's beyond tells. Beyond. There's tells, and then you can go beyond tells. And when I think about Blake, I think about a man who is not only broken through tells, he is also beyond tells. So shout um, out to Blake Eastman. You asked me – I got a funny story. You asked me, you asked me about my wife. and. Uh, uh -oh. <laughs> so I had this don't night. Get divorced, John. Don't get, don't get no, divorced. Not, Be careful. Never that. Never that. It, but but uh, th like a couple weeks ago, I had this like really bad like losing night. Okay, I'm not gonna say the amount, but it was bad. Like, yeah, like I got wrecked. Okay, and um, I am like wake up in the morning and I'm like, game and putting the third dollar straddle on this this game too. What's that? Were you drunk, drinking, or putting the third dollar straddle? On no, this I wasn't. Game? This was like. I was trying. Okay. This was like this. This was a real game. This wasn't like I mean there was straddling, but there was no thirty two hundred dollars straddle this time. 
Sure. And uh, like, but like the worst, my worst loss of the year for sure. I like wake up in the morning, you know, and you're kind of like, sometimes, you know, when you wake up, the first thing you think about is the session you had the night before. You ever have that? Yeah. Where you're like, oh man, like you wake up, you're like, yeah, fuck yeah, I crushed it last night. Or you wake up and you're like, dude, that was just, I got blasted. And so I'm like thinking that, you know, I'm kind of like, um, I'm kind of like, just like, like slogging around the house. And I walk into a, I walk into to my office and she's like, she's like, where are your headphones? I'm like, oh, I, I lost them. And she's like, John, she's like, those headphones are $30. You've probably lost three of those pairs. Like you need to be better about your money. And she's like telling me that like, so this is the difference between my, my wife and I, like she's like really, really good and tight with her money. You know, she doesn't like to spend money on stuff. And I'm like sitting there thinking about how badly I got blasted the night before. And, she, and I'm just like, oh yeah, like, yes, I, I guess I shouldn't tell you like how my session went last night. <laughs> I thought that story was going somewhere else. So I'm very, I, I, I thought I had to cut, I thought I was going to have to cut the pot. I thought, no, waking up in the bed. I, listen, I, I, had, I no. thought this was going somewhere else, John. I'm nice to see you took it there. And yes, I think that does give us a little bit of perspective on the way that you are different. Than life. But I, I envision you saying like you woke up, you were feeling bad, you suffered a nice bad night out. All of a sudden, whatever, man. Johnny Spice says, can you, can John tell the story from Ben Lab's birthday, please? So obviously you, you Ben Lamb, you and Chance Cornish out the Ben Johnson the camp. The guys are great friends. What's yeah, this, tell, what's this the story. story, John? What's the story looking like? All right. So uh, <laughs> this was uh, 2012 before I got married. And uh, oh. Ben has the best birthday parties, like always. Always gets like a, the best table at like the best club in Vegas. And this night it happened to be excess, right? <laughs> so um, don't get divorced, John. Be careful, please. No, I won't happen. So we show up, like, I think Excess opens at 10.30. Is that right? I've never showed up at, 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 to when Excess opens, so I do not well, know. For whatever reason, we had to be there at 10.30, so we like, show up at 10.30. And Ben loves shots. All right. He, like, loves shots. Immediately, we're taking uh, car bombs or Jameson shots. I can't remember what they were. But we're just, like, uh, pounding these shots. Easily before 11, we've had, like, four or five shots. So we're all, everybody is already, like, getting fucking wasted okay and so um my buddy i was like dude we got to go get some fresh air like let's go outside so you know you go outside in excess and there's like that bar that's outside and so uh we go over there we like get a drink and we're like ordering this bar and i'm already starting to get like pretty hammered right so um as we're like walking back towards the dance floor um there's these like three girls like dancing on each other like they're like grinding on each other and i'm like super distracted and i'm like watching it as i'm walking and i walk you know i'm in like my nicest clothes because of my excess and i walk right over the ledge like into the pool and just like Goo -goosh! like I, I hear this like big splash i'm like all disoriented pop out of the pool and i'm like oh my god like what the fuck's happening i get i like crawl out of the pool dude and my buddy is standing there at the ledge like laughing in my face and there's probably another you know 200 people that are laughing because they all just saw exactly what happened that like i just walked like right over the ledge into the fucking pool and so uh i walk i like walk into uh you know there's like that divider where like the dance floor meets the outside mm -hmm. and so i like walk in there and the music's playing and like i turn to my right and some like this asian girl starts like dancing on me and i'm like and I'm like laughing because I'm like, don't you see that like I'm soaking wet? But I guess she was probably so hammered that she didn't even like notice, right? And she like calls over a friend. She's like, hey, come over here. Like this guy's cool. Like we're having fun. And so we're just like we're like dancing for this is like ten minutes, you know. Time goes by. My friend is like looking at me and pointing at me and like laughing his ass off. So I go back to the table. I'm like, all right, I gotta like catch you. I'll catch up with you later. And I go back to the table. That was literally the last thing I remember. I wake up, but like snap my fingers. Next thing I wake up and I'm like turned around in my bed in my home. Like every, all the doors are open, like to outside, like everything's a wreck in my home. And I like couldn't remember literally anything. I text Ben, I'm like, dude, I'm like what, like what, like what, like why, what happened last night? I have no idea. And he's like, dude, you got, literally they had to carry me by my elbows out of excess and throw me in a cab and just send me home. The security like dragged me out of fucking excess. So I went from that to being fucking, yeah, I don't know, awake in my
my bet it sucked. It's funny, but yeah, I, bet, I, bet, I bet mom and dad are real proud. They're proud their son's not a went to poker and uh, and, and took this lifestyle over, not any dinner at all. <laughs> yeah, I was like, nah, that was my old ways. But nothing in the league of uh, I watched your uh, Viffer pod. <laughs> it's not in the Viffer league, that's for sure. <sighs> I feel, listen, I feel like if we knew all the things that happened this night, maybe it might be a little more out of line. But this, this night does sound like it was pretty out of line, John. It was a little bit out of line. That was, you, you, I kinda get white girl, you kinda get white girl wasted, you know that? You get like a white girl. You're like a drunken, you got like an eighteen year old white chick that, that don't know how to handle herself sometimes, it seems like. White girl wasted. WGW. That's gonna be your next hashtag. WGW. I've never heard that. That will not be my next new hashtag, no. Mm -mm, I don't think so. Hi, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, LJ. I, anyone that plays PLO, I, I don't even know anyone that like the thing is. All the PLO players I know for the most part are like have stories like this. And I have stories like this. Ola's got stories like this. this is yeah. have stories like all the PLO regulars, I and Chance, you know, I mean, you know, Ben, you know, they all, they all have stories like this. Jay Nandez, you know, Jay Nandez maybe got stories like this back in the day now. I don't know. Now he's like businessman. He's like, you know, he's very official. All about the biz. All about that. All about, he's telling, you know, guys, so he's, 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 he's GTO, man. I feel it's like the PLO community though is really cool because it's like it's kind of an us against them mentality sometimes because a lot of those guys like Fernando and these other PLO players have been around for a long time and it's always been kind of like us as PLO players versus no limit players. Everybody's been sort of trying to convince and lobby for PLO, you know what I mean? For a long time. So I think it's cool. I think it's cool to see PLO growing. There's nothing I would like to see more, actually. So when you become Mr. China P PLO. You will be our savior. The great game of Pot Limit Omaha, John. That's how you say it. Okay. So tell, tell me, you tell me more about the bet. Have you even talked about the bet on the pod yet? No, nah, man. I ain't talked about the bet yet on the pod, kid. I'm not trying to get to the bet the pod, man. Listen, John, I got to be honest with you, bro. I got to be honest with you, bro. Um, it's going to be hard from studying, getting in the Mandarin lab for these first couple days. So I've been, I have a bet, guys. It's my $7,500 to my friends, $45,000. I have one year to do a 30-minute podcast in Mandarin only. I could use some English in there, but it's got to be in Mandarin. I have to be able to speak it. Now, you know, I, I don't be perfect, but I just have a conversation in the language. Yeah, yeah. And if it's close, if, if it's not, we're going to have judges as well to verify. I get to do this as many times as I want. So if I want to try it 100 times, I can try it 100 times and fuck up. So I got some room for error. And people out there are so convinced that I have absolutely no chance. First of all, John, do these fuckers know who they're talking to, man? It's the it's, it's same it's 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 John from, from fucking down the street there, man. It's the same Jimmy from, from around the corner at the local, local Burger King, man. This is Big Poppy, man. These people are out there, mind, John. They've been saying this for years about these prop bets, man. They've been saying no chance, no, you know what? Easy, man. Light work. Easy, John. Light work. Light, Light work. work. You can script. I mean, well, that might be kind of shady, I guess. Yeah, I'm not. I ain't about that cheap life, bro. I don't do these bets. I don't. I don't. I don't do that shit, man. I could have got out of line in all my fucking bets I have, man. And by the way, guys, if I if I lose seven point five k, what the for fuck's sakes, man? Come on, it, it, there's, there's worse things that can happen. You lose seventy five hundred dollars. I mean, I, people act like I'm losing a fucking limb. People are like, oh my god, you better buy it. It's seventy five hundred dollars, guys. This ain't, this ain't a million dollars, okay? No. All right, it's the prop bet king you're talking. It's the prop bet losers, prop bet king. All right, line it up, man. I told JMO. He said he'll bet my net worth. I said JMO, put up two million dollars. I'll put up three hundred fifty, whatever the fuck it is, three hundred fifty thousand dollars. Let's make the bet. Let's do it, man. I'm willing to do it. There's no chance I'm not going to be able to do this, man. If seventy five trillion people can speak it, Poppy, I'll be able to speak it. That's all I got to say. Plus, you'll be able to get into uh, some Macau games. You can go. You can go over there and fire at some of the PLO games over there. Listen, I've been looking at these fucking bungalows in the middle of China. Getting a place there for three months, maybe six months. I don't care however long I need to, man. I'll be eating chopsticks with the rice and getting the best shit in my life. Be ripped up, speaking Mandarin, won't even know who the fuck I am anymore. There you go. There you go. That sounds fun, man. I, I'm pulling for you. Maybe I'll get. I'll bet some side action on you. Listen, a lot of people are looking for action against me, John. Forty-five k to seven and a half. Actually, it, against Peter, right? This is against Peter, isn't it? Yeah, Peter Jennings and my buddy Jonathan Bales. Yeah. God, I'm gonna have to talk shit to him. I see so yeah, Peter and I I see him in Denver sometimes. We play no limit together sometimes. Mm, yeah, he told me about this. Yeah. 
He, uh, Johnny says, Joe, if you go to China and can't use Twitter, how would you survive? That'd be perfect, man. You know what, John? I made a realization that last night, my friend. I made a realization last night is that no matter how much GTO Twitter is for my business, for my brand, for, for whatever, and, and it, I, I need to I need to stay off Twitter. It takes up too much of my time. I just, I spend, I click on a YouTube video. I just, I'm not implementing sacrifice into my life. I'm letting all these things I enjoy into my life and I'm not sacrificing them for the things that really mean the most to me. And Twitter, like I enjoy reading the things, I enjoy it, I go to a video, whatever. You know, but I, I just, I'm spending too much time on there, on my phone in general. I wanna break my phone, John. My phone's literally broken right now. I don't wanna go fix it. I just want it to be broken. Because last night I got no phone, you got no choice to do it. I feel like this phone has fucked me up so hard and I just get lost. I go on YouTube, I'm watching a fucking YouTube basketball video. I love basketball, man. But at the same time, it's not deep down what I really want to be doing in Big Poppy's heart, in Big Poppy's soul. And uh, I'm not sure about this new third person lingo I've been using. Shout out to my boy Donald Trump. But uh, but yeah, that's kind of what I'm thinking about the phone right now, man. How do you handle that, buddy? How do you how do you how do you sort of how do you sort it's so of it's decide so the priority for you? I couldn't do it. I couldn't do without the phone. I couldn't do without it. It's too hard. I mean, a lot of what I do nowadays is correspondence, so it's just it's just a must. But I, I, I hear what you're saying. Sometimes, like, it feels like the phone kind of owns you. And you don't remember that your phone is supposed to be, like, a tool to help you achieve something else. People say that about their emails. You know, they feel like they're – I'm kind of like that. Like, they're slaves to their emails, and they forget mm -hmm. that, like, your email is a communication tool. I, I don't know how to really explain that, but it's hard, man, nowadays with phones for sure. I mean, I don't know. It, it, se it seems like it'd be pretty tough for you to not use your phone. It's like a big part of your branding is posting on social and shit. I gotta stop. Gotta stop, man. I gotta stop. Sacrifice the good now for the great later. So that quote, that's a quote that I, I remember I said a long time ago. But you know, maybe, maybe I thought the sacrifice and then was to get to the great now, but now I'm supposed to be in the great. So but it's you gotta keep it's all relative and you gotta keep sacrificing, you gotta keep prioritizing. And I feel like my biggest leak right now is just spending way too much time on things that I enjoy or that are good, but not deep down what I want. And when I think more about why I'm struggling with the things that I really want to do. It's because I'm letting so many of these other little things in my life. And I think it's going to require a big change, a big step someplace else, especially if I want to win this prop bet, John. The way I'm going now, I ain't going to be able to win this prop bet, man. I'll be doing all these weird fucking things too much. I just like, do this or do that or do this or do that. So, yep. I don't know. It'll be worth it, man. I mean, do you really want – like, how did it come up? Why Chinese? Like, what? how did this even come so, up? So, here was John. Listen, you're going to think I'm a fish. I'm not – I'm prop bet king. I'm not prop bet – I'm not prop bet easy, okay? So, we had a bet. I would do a – I got one year to do a Spanish podcast, only 30 minutes. I got four to one. My 5K to win 20,000. The other guy at the table, Dan, shout out to Dan. He works for uh, one of Phil Gaffon's friends that works with him on Run at Once. He says, hey, what about Mandarin? Mandarin, and I thought about it. I said, China's taken over. You know, Mandarin's taken, like, this is something, like, Spanish. What if I don't, I, whatever, Spanish, Spanish. Okay, whatever. What am I going to do Spanish? But Mandarin, potentially, that's something I could do. That's something I could potentially do more of. I could be involved in that world. I could, you know, create something for that world content or PLO something, poker-related something. It's growing there. So I thought, you know what? Let's make it Mandarin. I looked up some things online. I saw it's a lot of hours, but you know, I was like, all right, let's do six to one, 75 to win 45, and then we booked it. Yeah, there's gotta be some type of way to also leverage like the pub publicity from that. I don't know how, but. Exactly, I mean, that's the thing is like in terms of content, in terms of whatever I'm doing, there's there's like, you know, this is like a, this is what legends are made of, John. Anyone who, I, you know, fucking 10 years from now, I'm not gonna be like, yeah, you know, like, oh, I learned Spanish, and you're a big fucking deal. I learned Mandarin now, man, you know what I'm saying? This is like, it's a legendary thing. And I made another prop bet, too. I have to get O.J. Simpson, Shaquille O'Neal, or Kesha on the podcast in one year. I got three to one on that. So we'll see if we can I think that one's easy. That one's super easy. I feel like that one's going to be really easy. Yeah, that's, so, they, that's so easy. It's so, wow. It's, it's, that, when I think about how easy that is, it makes me almost sad how easy that is. I, I mean, yeah. I don't I – don't, with, I would that be... with that said, I think we might be having Shaq on the podcast here in a couple weeks. So, uh, so yeah. Al Mattis says, you're probably going to spend 10K on Manor unless I don't give a fuck how much I spent. There's, I got to say, man, there's a lot of people revealing themselves since I made this prop at John. A lot of people that are weak-minded, donk motherfuckers. I wanted to make sure I worded that correctly. Weak-minded, donk motherfuckers, John. Talking about buying out. Talking about 
No. Draw and dead. What kind of losing fucking mentality mindset are these people got? You're drawing. I'm not drawing fucking dead. You guys kidding me, man? I mean, I can't believe some of these people out there. These, these got to be some of the biggest donks I've ever seen in my life, John. These guys can't be winning. They're not winning that much if they're at that. I'm just telling you, with this mindset, anything's possible, like my boy Kevin Garnett said, all right? Anything's possible. Yeah, dude. All right, tell me what you would do in, in this kind of situation, all right? Okay. So, you know, I did okay. that. You remember I do these, like, weight loss prop bets, okay? Sure. So I put on Twitter a couple months ago that I wanted to do, like, a fitness or weight loss prop bet with somebody. And this dude direct messaged me and said, I want to gain weight. So can we do a bet where you lose, you say whatever amount you want to lose, I say whatever amount I want to gain. And then, uh, you know, we bet it. I'm like, yeah, it doesn't matter. It's just supposed to keep like me or us accountable. So it doesn't matter. Like whatever it is, I don't care. So he says that he wanted to actually gain weight. So he wanted to be, I can't remember what the amount was, but it was like $165 and or 165, 165 pounds. And I wanted to be, I, I weighed like 205 at the time. And I wanted to be uh, 187 and a half. We settled on the number. Okay. But like it was supposed to be by October 24th was the date. But like a week ago, he messaged me and asked me to buy out for $200. So like, what is a normal, how do you settle on a, on a buyout amount? Cause I didn't want to not let him buy out, but I thought that 200 was fucking weak, especially since we're so far away. Wait, it's how much did you guys bet? He wanted to bet. We bet 2k. And he wanted to buy out for two hundred. And, and the bet him, ends on October twenty fourth. Yeah. No, go saying, be able to do it. No, man, you know, buying out. No, October twenty fourth, two hundred bucks, man. Pay me. I thought like I was like I mean I don't want to not let the guy buy out because I mean I don't care but I feel like there's some, some like it didn't seem right for only two hundred bucks. Yeah, I mean I I I've never bought out of bet John. All right. I don't negotiate buyouts. I'm not letting anybody buy out of nothing. I'm not buying out of nothing. So I don't know. I'm not about that buyout life. I don't, I don't work that way. I ain't built like that, man. I'm not doing something to buy out. I want to lose. I want to fucking lose. I'm not buying it. No, nothing. I can, not be able to do. I can respect that. It's 11 days away, bro. That guy ain't got on the plane. I mean, come on, man. Take your fucking loss and move on, man. I know. That's how I feel. That's it. That's how, that's exactly. I didn't even consider like the buyouts. You know what I mean? Joriski says, I studied manner for two years and it's definitely possible if you're a GTO. I was drunk every night before I went to class, so for me it was not GTO. I agree. That's probably not GTO, Dom. But so are you let the guy buy out or what are you gonna do? You're gonna charge him 2K? I mean check 2K, baby. Let's make it rain someplace for 2K. I let, I let him buy out. I'm not gonna do him like that. But I just How much are you let him buy out for? I let him buy out for the 200, but I feel like I played it poorly. I'm not trying to like get this guy for money, but I just felt like it was I should I should I should have I should have charged him more. They ain't teaching him shit, bro. You gotta understand, you're doing him a disservice. You're letting him know if he don't try, he needs to buy out. That's weak. I know. I wasn't happy about it. I wasn't happy about it. Blake says, I lost 20 pounds in three months, 10 pounds in the last three days because of a bet with John. Yeah. Almost passed out in the sauna. Good, man. You should have passed out in the sauna, man. Get a lesson taught. You don't want, we don't want to kill you, but you need a lesson, man. Why but, you wait till the last three days to do that? Blake and I bet, uh, we had a weight loss bet. I had to weigh, I think it was one, 185 and his was 175, if I remember right. But uh, it was for, um, the, if, you, if you've lost, you had to give 50% of your WSOP main event winnings, a 50% free roll to the other guy in the WSOP main event. I'll make a bet like that with you, sure. Okay. You want to make a bet like that with me? Okay, I'll make a bet like that with you. But what tournament? What what, what turn? Like for WSOP main event next year, John. I'll happily, I'll happily give you fifty percent of my main event. Oh my god! Free roll, free roll. If you, I, hey, listen, you want fifty percent? I'll give fifty percent. Okay. Tell you what, <clears throat> then I'll reach a retweet contest and I'll give fifty more percent to the people on Twitter. How about oh, that? God. We could do it for the. Uh, Seth Baldwin says this dude reminds me of Matt Damon and Rounders for some reason. There we go. I'll take it as a compliment. That's true. My girl goes to me, Blake, make a bet with John again. <laughs> bang, yeah. bang. Let's take a couple of questions from the chat, guys. We'll take a couple on here. And uh, and yeah, man, Anders says, yeah, but are you actually going to make it on time next year? I'm going to be honest with you guys, and I'm, gonna t I'm just going to tell you what I'm going to do. So next year, I'm going to do another retweet contest for the main event giveaway. I'm going to say I'm so sorry for what happened last year. All right? I'm going to give away. I'm telling you what's going to happen right now. 
I'm going to give away 35%. I'm going to say, I'm sorry. Like, I'm just sorry for this. No matter what happens, though, I'll give away a minimum of $1,000. And then the day before the main event starts, I'm going to take a plane. to. So I'm going to go out one night. I'm going to tell a story. I'm going to get drunk that night. Maybe take some performance nasty drugs, whatever. And then the next day, I'm going to wake up on a beach in a fucking another place without anything. No money, no wallet, no nothing, just my cell phone. And I'm going to put up there and say, man, I'm going to try to make it back. I'm going to try to make it back to the main event. And then I'm not going to make it back because I'm going to be on an island someplace. That's what I'm going to do next year, guys. I can't believe how many people didn't know that was a clear troll. I mean, I don't know. What are you calling 3,300 people stupid? What if it wasn't, though? It clear, like, you would never do that. You wouldn't play the main. I know you. I was so yeah. sure it was a troll right away. No way. You wouldn't do that. Well, in case it wasn't, it you, get, you know, you got, you got, you lose, it should be a bet where if you lose, you have to play the main event. No. Yeah. Fuck no, I'm not doing them shit like that. Zach says, you're going to play a two-car pop in the tournament. Sounds awful. Exactly, man. I know about that life. Come on, man. Let's get a couple hey. questions here from the chat, guys. David Castillo, my boy Digital Fox. What's up, pop? What's up, brother? What's happening, man? Popinga. Uh, Baba, Niha, 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 motherfucker. He says, Joey or Bopre, have you checked out Doug's cryptocurrency site yet? Thoughts? I have not checked out the cryptocurrency site for Doug yet. I don't, I don't know much about crypto. I did briefly. I mean, it seems legit. I mean, Doug's never gonna. Doug's the kind of guy where he's not gonna do something unless he can do it well, you know. And he certainly has the resources and connections to make it awesome. So I'm sure it's gonna be great. I mean, I'm not an expert in crypto. I have a decent Vest in it, vested interest in it, but I have just basically blindly followed people who are a lot smarter than I am. It's mm -hmm. tough to say. I mean, I'm optimistic about crypto, but I think that some people are overly optimistic. I'm just kind of cautious. I think it's like one of those things where everyone I know who's really excited and optimistic about crypto, spoiler, they have a lot of crypto. It's like asking a real estate agent what they think is going to happen with the real estate market. It's like they're going to tell you that the real estate market is. Working great. So right. it's tough. It, it's tough to say about crypto. I mean, I think it's interesting and it's clearly like an unbelievable technology, but I'm just like cautiously optimistic about it. I, I'm excited to learn more about it on Doug's. Yeah, I think if you have a lot of crypto, the GTO plan is to tout crypto as much as you can because it's gonna just do better for crypto if more people are interested in it. So yeah. I mean it, it makes sense to say things like that. Yeah. It's nice. I mean, Bitcoin's been on such a heater. So yeah. I mean that's good. I think I think if you don't know what you're doing, you should probably find somebody who does and let them trade for you and just pay them a big. I don't know though. John Spicer says, if John could go back to when he was a small stakes grinder and give himself one piece of advice, what would it be? Play more. Mm. Play as much as possible. Work on your mm. mental game first, probably. Be mm. honest and subjective about what your biggest weakness is and then focus on turning that weakness into a strength. So when you're a big mistake that a lot of players make, <clears throat> this happens all the time, like they want to, they re they love PLO and they want to get good at it. And then they kind of are like, well, I'm going to go get a coach, like a coach will fix me. And then they go to a coach and they say, oh, I'm not winning as much playing PLO as I want to. Like, teach me, teach me how, rather than like already knowing what their biggest weakness is or what they should work on. And then going to a coach and saying, hey, my biggest weakness is three bet pots. Teach me, let's let's work on just three bet pots for 10 hours and then going through <laughs> going through each part of your game like that. Got a book for that. That's right. Got a book for that. Three bet pots right here. I think my right. biggest my biggest piece of advice would be John to myself would be would be stop shot taking so much and just focus on the stakes that you're at until you do build up that adequate bankroll. Even when your shot takes go well, they do they really go well because then you want to do it more. If I'm going to shot take, shot take in optimal conditions, don't 24 table when you shot take, dumb fuck. That's what I would tell myself. <laughs> dumb fuck. Hey, asshole, don't play all the tables when you want to move up to fucking two, four, three, six, or five, ten, no and hold them. You don't got to play all the tables, dumb fuck, all right? That's what I tell myself, John, because I was the biggest fucking idiot of all. I would play like, dude, man, I would I would make so much money at, at these lower stakes, and then I would have these sessions where I lost 50 buy-ins, 50 buy-ins, 50 buy-ins. Yeah. It depends on what your goals are. Like, 
I know guys who are excellent poker players who never play higher than 50 cent dollar. And like for them, they're just sort of like, oh, I never have to get any better. Um, I can make, you know, $4,000 a month and it's stress-free, but yeah, they'll never get rich, but they don't have to work for anybody and it's good money. But yeah. other people, you know, if you really want, I, my personal belief is that I think it's easy to like make a living playing poker depending on like, you know, what you're li- like, it, certainly as like a single younger dude, it's pretty easy to like make a living and cover your, your bills, but to make like <clears throat> really great money to the point where you're like making money and having enough left over to invest in things and stuff like that, it's pretty tough. So it just depends on what your goals are. You have to be honest about what your goals are and then figure out how to create a path to it. I guess that's true. My goal always was, you know, I wanted to play the the top the top stakes table. So the only way I saw that was by moving up the stakes to get to the top stakes up the tables. You know what I'm saying? That's the only way to get up there is you got to keep moving up. I didn't care about anything else, man. I was happy eating McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's, Taritos, <laughs> Margaritas, Quesadillas, Bonitas, all that thing. Fuck, man, I don't know. Lee says, listening to Joe and Doug has totally changed the way I play poker to the better for sure. Good stuff. I hope so, man. I hope so, guys. Oh, yeah. I hope so out there. John, we got anything else we want to add for the people out there today? I was trying to keep this an hour, but I can't, I, I can't keep an hour. I suck. I'm like... I keep ten hours if I if I really wanted to, but I, I tried. I'm trying to do some shorter ones for certain people out there, and maybe that might work with more people. Want I, I don't really know. I, I feel like John. I feel like um. Give you I'll give you guys a little insight here. So I think that when I was focused, you know, because like I think Doug's kind of you know he's taken the YouTube, he's the YouTube hack. He's hack, got the YouTube system down right, and you know for these guys all about views and stuff like that. I feel like when I was starting to think more about how do I get more like getting more views on stuff and creating more content. That's more view friendly. Just wasn't enjoying creating that kind of content, man. Like, and especially I talk about Nolan Hole oftentimes. Like, I don't give a fuck about two card pop with Omaha, man. I like, I don't, I just don't care. Like, I don't, I like don't want it. I, you know what I'm saying? I think that once you start going down that 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 quantity route of views or money and stuff like that, I don't know, man. For me, it just feels so. Makes me feel not very, uh, not very a lot of things, I suppose. So. Yep. So now I've been thinking about, you know, how can I not necessarily obsess about or focus on it, but also, you know, be aware of it and want people to enjoy my content podcast and watch it and, you know, those sort of things. So for sure. I agree. That's what I've been thinking about lately. David Castillo, any advice for when you reach a level of success? I feel less motivated now that I don't have to work hard. Sometimes you have to <laughs> um, inject motivation into you by an external source so like i think that you need to create some type of for me it's about placing bets on myself yeah i mean one thing is like we were talking about having a kid earlier it's like i mean it creates a new structure for you where you like have no choice but to bust your ass and i feel like you really need to figure out most people i feel i would say 98 or 99 percent of people can't internally motivate themselves to succeed like how they want to succeed they need to have some other external thing um motivate them to do that so i don't know what that is for you maybe you need to place a bet on yourself with somebody else to achieve what you actually want to achieve but i would say figure figure out what that is i like that jan spicer joe john any predictions for poker after dark with bill perkins and bob vulgaris I don't know. I don't know. Who else is playing? Um, Phil Galfond, uh, Doug Polk, um, Brandon Adams, Brian Rat, Brand- and Brian. I, I bet, well, I bet Brandon does really well. I think that Brandon is going to do well in that lineup. He's going to just play solid. <sighs> yeah, we'll see what happens. Guys, I'm going to be back on Monday with um, – New podcast with Oh Hey Sydney. High stakes, current high stakes player. This fucking kid's crazy. I love him. This kid is on the girl grind every day in Ukraine. I love this fucking kid. I'm excited to have him on. Uh, if you want to follow John on Twitter, it's at John Bo Prey. J Bo Prey. B E U P R E Z. John Bo Prey. And uh, you want to check out the manual? There's a link in the description below. PLOQuickboard.com the products as well. Chip leader coaching. You want to apply for chip leader coaching? That's where you don't get too much into chip leader coaching. If you want to apply for chip leader coaching, apply now. And um, yeah, I don't really know much about chip leader coaching, so I guess you know that, that, that is this tournament we're all at. I just fucking stay away from that stuff, guys. I'm gonna be honest with you. But uh, but yeah, what else, John? What am I missing here? Instagram. What, what's your Instagram? I don't have Instagram actually. I wish I did. I just don't. 
I'm trying to keep the distractions a little bit less. Although yeah. I know Instagram is GTO. Don't do it, bro. You don't need it, man. You don't need it. Trust me. Yeah, I don't have Instagram. So I'm probably the only one in the world. All right, guys. That's all we got. We'll be back soon. And um, much love. Adios. Peace out. Thanks, Joy. See you guys later.